writing this rich, beautiful book. And then chapter 1 of Ephesians, this prison letter to the church of Ephesus, just having some of the most beautiful theology in all the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 1. And he, he opens this chapter with this, this beautiful thing, and then about halfway through the chapter, he transitions to a writing out what he prays for, for the people of Ephesus. A powerful prayer. So we're going to look at that prayer today. Again, we're jumping into chapter 1, looking at that prayer. I'm going to read all these verses. We're going to read them, then we're going to walk through them together. So I want you to follow along in your Bible as we read 15 all the way to 23. So hang on with me as we go through this. All right, jumping at 15, the prayer that he writes to the people of Ephesus. Here we go. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over the things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. There's a lot there. That's Paul's writing, Paul writing out what he prays for for these people that's not like the prayers i pray now if i wrote my prayer out it would say god my car is not working and i feel kind of bad and i'm a little frustrated and all that paul writes a prayer it's loaded with all kinds of wonderful things so let's look at this prayer the first thing paul as he's thinking about other people again i just i've said this before just a minute ago before we get going he's in prison He's focused on other people. That's pretty amazing. He's not focused on himself. He's not focused on his chains. He's not focused on his own bondage. He's focused on other believers in other places while in prison. That's an amazing faith. That's a selfless faith. While he's in prison, he says, I've heard, in verses 15 and 16, I've heard about your faith. Now, how, how does he hear about their faith when he's in prison? I don't, I don't guess he checked his smartphone, did he? No, didn't get an email. Now, now okay, so pr Paul is in prison, but people are coming and going and visiting him. They're bringing things to him. They're helping him. So he's not completely isolated. So if you read the book of Ephesus, you go to the last book of Ephesus, you can see uh, it mentions by name a guy named Tychicus. We think Tychicus is the guy that brought the information to him. But nevertheless, people are bringing information to Paul. So someone came to Paul and said, hey, let me tell you about what's going on at Ephesus, that church that you used to minister to. And he hears about it and he's like, wow, wow. I, I'm, I'm blown away that what you guys are doing. Look what he says in verses 15 and 16. He says, for this reason, too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. 15 and 16. He's heard of their faith and he's motivated, motivated by their faith. Their faith in who? Their faith in the Lord Jesus. He's like, man, this is great. This is awesome. I'm so glad if I could put it in my own words, it, it would be like saying, I'm so glad that even though I'm in prison, you guys are still worshiping God, and you're still serving Jesus Christ. That is amazing. And oh, by the way, I'm constantly mentioning you in my prayers, verse 16. I, the prisoner, 
am constantly mentioning you in my prayers. Not just occasionally mentioning you. What does he say in verse 16? I do not cease to give thanks for you while making mention in you of my prayers. Paul is thinking about believers in another location while he's in prison, and he's doing it on a regular basis. That's amazing. That is amazing. So he's giving thanks for them. Let, let's stop and pause there for a second. When we are hurting in our own lives, you know, we're not sitting in a prison cell in here right now. When we're hurting in our own lives, in some other type of situation besides prison, maybe we're having financial difficulties, maybe we're having physical difficulties, maybe we're facing death itself, maybe we have family difficulties, whatever that pain is, who are we usually focused on in our prayers? I don't know about you, but I'm usually focused on me. Um, if, if I take this example that Paul has in Ephesians 1, 15 to 16, in chains, thinking about other people, that, that affects how I pray, doesn't it? I should be thinking of other people in my hardship. That's different. That's convicting. But I think that's a great example of how we should live our life. In our pain, in our sorrows, yes, God cares. Yes, God is concerned. But can we still think of others in the midst of our trials? Yes, we can. Yes, we can do that, can't we? That's right, we can. All right, so here he is. He's in prison. He's thinking about other people. He's praying for them regularly. Now, what does he pray for? What does he actually want these people to do? Uh, to do, or what, what does he want God to do in their life? Well, there's six, there's six things. There's six things that God, that, that Paul really wants God to do in these people's life. I want you to, to walk with me through 17 through 19, verses 17 through 19. This is what he wants God to do in their life. So here we go. Six things. The first one we're going to see is wisdom and revelation. You can see them up on the screen. Wisdom and revelation, knowledge of God. He wants to pray about their heart, pray about their calling, riches and inheritance, I like that, and surpassing power. Six things he wants to pray about for these people. Let's look at verse 17. Here we go. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. So stop right there. Number one, that God would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit, because they already have that. He's already previously in chapter 1 said, you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. He's talking about, you know, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, like as far as like an understanding in their mind, in their heart, to have wisdom and understanding. What, what is wisdom? What is wisdom? It's knowing what to do with truth. It's knowing what to do with information. And what is revelation? Revelation is simply something that was once hidden is now seen. Paul, as he's praying for these people, and these six things that he wants for them, he says, the first thing I want you to have is I want you to know with wisdom and revelation what God wants you to do in your life. That's number two. Go back to verse 17, that God, our Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. That's the second thing. Wisdom and revelation, but wisdom and revelation in what? In him. Hey, it's great that you're smart. It's great that you know things. It's great that you're wise. It's great that things have been revealed to you that were previously unknown. But Paul says, you need to know about God. And that's part, part of the prayer. That's the second thing he mentioned. I want you to know about God. Well, what else does he want them to know in this prayer? He wants them to have wisdom and revelation. He wants them to have knowledge of God. He also wants something else. Their heart. Let's, look at, let's continue. Verse 17 again. That God may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Go on to verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened 
so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Stop right there. The eyes of your heart. What is an eye of your heart? I have seen eyes in people, eyes in animals. I've seen eyes on potatoes. I've seen all kinds of eyes, but I've never seen eyes on a heart. Now, maybe anybody else see eyes of a heart? No. No. He says, I want you to, the, the eyes of your heart to be enlightened. I think we have a saying in our modern culture, you know, 2,000 years almost removed from Paul. We say, hey, with your mind's eye, you can see something, right? We say that. We, we know your eye doesn't have a, your brain doesn't have an eyeball in it. Um, he's just saying in your heart, in the center of your emotions, that part of you that, that, is, that it contains laughter and, and joy and, and thinking, that, that emotional part of you that's immaterial part of you. He goes, I want that part of you, the eyes of your heart, to be enlightened. He, said he doesn't want them to live in darkness. He doesn't want the inner being of the people of Ephesus to be full of darkness. He wants it to be full of light. And that kind of ties into number one and number two up there on the screen. Wisdom and revelation. Knowledge of God. So that your heart will be enlightened. And this is all part of the prayer. A powerful prayer. What else does he want for them? We're going to try to go through these a little faster. He also wants for them to know something about their calling. What is their calling? Look at verse 18, about near the middle. He says, the eyes of your heart enlightened, da 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 da, da that you would know the hope of his calling. What is the hope of his calling in the middle of verse 18? What is that? Not a phone call. We often will say in our Christian experience, I, I feel called to do something. Or we'll often say, I think I'm called to the mission field. Or I think I'm called to the pastor. I think I'm called. We say that a lot. But what, what really is our calling? You are called. If you trusted Jesus Christ, you're all, we all are called to put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior one Savior, one God, one Holy Spirit, one church, one Bible. You are called into that. And Paul, in his prayer, he wants them to understand, along with these other things on the list, he wants them to understand that's your calling. He wants them to walk in that and to know God the Father and to know the Son and to know the Holy Spirit and know the Word and be part of the local church. And yes, find out what spiritual gift God's given you and serve. Know the hope of your calling. It's a pretty good list of prayer stuff so far, isn't it? I mean, who doesn't like wisdom and revelation? Who doesn't like knowledge of God? Who doesn't want to have their heart uh, enlightened? Who doesn't want to know more about their calling, how God wants you to live for Him? And let's go to number five there. Riches and inheritance. Now, I like that one. I mean, number one through four is not so bad, but riches and inheritance, I'm kind of like, what? What would you say? Um, I'm, good for, I'm good with this. He wants them to know about the riches and inheritance. Look at the end of verse 18, right after he mentions their calling. He says, the hope of this calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints? That's a mouthful. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints? What is he saying there? It's very simple. God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, they want something from this earth. They don't want the dirt. They don't want the buildings. They don't want the trees. They have all that stuff already. One day, God's going to get rid of all this stuff. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to get rid of everything. But there's something that he wants from this earth that he's not going to get rid of. You know what that is? It's you. Everything else is going to go away. You can go to the book of Revelation, flip to the very end, and you can start reading. Wow, everything's gone. And he makes everything brand new again except for you and me. We are his inheritance. We are what remains after the old stuff is gone. That's what an inheritance is. The old life has passed away. This is being passed on to someone else. 
That's what he's saying. Paul's saying, I'm praying that you have wisdom and knowledge and you understand what God wants for your life. But I also want you to understand that you're part of God's inheritance. You're important to God. You matter. And that's part of this prayer. And we do matter to God, don't we? We matter enough that he sent his son to die for us, to take us out of this world and have something wonderful for us. All right, number six. Six things that I said he was mentioning in this prayer. Um, this is not the end of the sermon, but this is the sixth thing as part of the, what the prayer content is. He also wants them to know number six about the surpassing greatness of his power. We're actually slipping into verse 19 now. The surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now, how many of you want power in your life? Okay, not many. All right. <laughs> I guess our power battery level's full. Um, you know, a few nights ago, we had a pretty nasty storm, and we all wanted power. I mean, I had no power going. I wanted power. I mean, we waited until it come back on. It was humid that night, and I wanted the power back on. How many of us want power in our life, right? We do. We know, you know, how many of us pray, oh, God, give me power, give me strength? And sometimes in Christianity, we, we, we pray for God to give us power. Like, we want God to raise the dead and heal the sick and make people rich and all that. And, and I think God sometimes scratching his head going, you know, I, I can do those things. Maybe I'll do those things, but that's not really the right power source. Paul wants these people, as he's praying through all these things we mentioned before, he also wants them to understand what the real power in their faith is. And that real power is mentioned in verse 19 as a surpassing greatness. The power of God, which we're going to talk about just a couple more verses here about the power of God. Paul wants them to understand the power of God above and beyond kind of power in your life. He wants them to know what it is. And we're about to find out what that power is. We're about to find out. Before we do, I want to ask you some questions. We just went through six statements. And I've read them before. I'm going to read them again. Six things that Paul wants to pray for in their life. Wisdom and knowledge. Their heart, their calling, riches and inheritance, surpassing power. Do you have these things in your own life? If you're a believer, the answer is yes. Are you cognizant that these things, or aware that these things are available to you in your life? And if, you, if you're at least aware that they're available to you as part of what God wants to do in your life, Maybe you say, I kind of lack some understanding in these areas. I don't really fully understand these things, God. You know what you can do? You can simply ask God to help you. If those six things that I mentioned don't make much sense to you, well, this is what James said. He said, if any of us lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously, and without reproach, and it will be taken to committee and considered. No, it doesn't say that. If we lack wisdom, we ask God, he gives generously, and it will be given to him. I'll be honest, I don't fully understand all those things in this list. I don't fully understand everything that Paul said he was praying for. So, I'm going to do what James said, and I'm going to ask, God, would you help me to understand what this surpassing greatness is and power is? I don't understand that. God, would you help me to understand what the riches of the inheritance mean? I don't fully understand that. God, would you help me to understand what my calling is as I'm part of this body of Christ? I don't understand that. And God says, you know what? That's a great place to start. Just ask me. All right. So Paul, he's a prisoner. We've already established that fact. He's a prisoner. He wrote the book of Ephesus from prison. He has heard of the great faith of the people in Ephesus. He has made this wonderful prayer with those six things. And number six on the list was a surpassing great power. And I asked you guys if you wanted power. There's something about that idea of 
wanting the people of Ephesus to understand the power of God in their life that really got Paul's attention. Because after mentioning the other things, he kind of shifts into a discussion about power and stays there for a few verses. I kind of think it's important. The power of God important. You know what? We're going to go there now. We're going to see in these last few verses the power of God in our life that Paul wanted these believers to understand. You know what kind of power it was? Resurrection power. We'll touch on that briefly in a moment. Authoritative power or power over authority and lordship power. That's the power that Paul wanted these people to understand is available for them through Jesus Christ in their life. Resurrection power, power over authority, and lordship power. Let's take a look at these in these verses as he's continuing this discussion on this prayer for these people in Ephesus. Number one, resurrection power, verse 20. Let's jump in there. He says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. He kind of jumped into a sentence there, a little broken sounding. But basically he's saying, this resurrection power, verse 20, was brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Did God exhibit power when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Yes, he did. We read about this in church. We read about this in Sunday school. We've gotten to the point where it's, we're almost numb to it. Okay, he rose Jesus from the dead. So what? How many of you could raise somebody from the dead? How many people would it take to raise somebody from the dead? How many doctors, engineers, physicists, medical professionals would it take to raise a single person from the dead? Better yet, let's just forget a person. Let's, let's find a dead mouse and try to raise him from the dead. I, I don't think the collective might of every human being with all of our intelligence and all of our equipment that we've ever had in the entire history of humanity could even bring a single dead mouse back to life if he's truly dead. All of our might and all of our power and all of our wisdom and all of our intellect, we can't even bring a bug back to life. So when, G when in Paul, as he's praying for these people in Ephesus, and he wants them to understand the power of God in, in their life, and he mentions one of these types of power as resurrection power, that is powerful. He brought Jesus out of the grave, and then 40 days later, according to the book of Acts, he took him up to heaven, and he put him in a place of authority. He took him from the lowest place, dead. You can't get any lower than that. I mean, maybe hell you could, but Jesus was never in danger of going to hell. He was not condemned. He takes Jesus from the lowest place, dead, lifts him out of the grave, brings him back to life, and then raises him up all the way up to highest authority, period, and puts him at his right hand and says, you are going to sit beside me and rule. Now, he already had power and authority, but what God did was he gave him additional honor and additional glory, additional responsibilities on top of what he already had by nature of being the son of God. So the power that we have in our life that Paul was praying for these people in Ephesus, it is a resurrection power that God can take you and bring you back to life one day as well and take your sins and remove them from you and you can count on that. This power is also an authoritative power. Not just a resurrection power, it's an authoritative power. Let's look at verses 21 and 22. As he raised him up, as he took Jesus out of the grave and raised him up, it says he raised him in verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. We'll stop there. Jesus is not just sitting at the right hand of God idly. We know from other references in Scripture that he is engaged in a ministry of prayer for us. 
That's not all he's doing. He is right now seated as Lord over everything. Every person, everything, every angel, including Satan himself. It may not look like it. Sometimes you look at the world and you go, Jesus, you're in charge? I mean, really? This is what you do when you're in charge? Yes, he's in charge. He's in charge. It's going the way he wants it to go. It's strange to think that, isn't it? He's already told us in the Bible what the plan is, and it's going to go that way. Look at the verse again. He raised him up in verse 21. Far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Jesus is Lord over you, whether you acknowledge it or not. He's Lord over your boss, whether they acknowledge it or not. He is Lord over the company you work for, whether they acknowledge it or not. He's Lord over the country, whether we acknowledge it or not. He is Lord over this earth, whether we acknowledge it or not. And when he says he wants to come back, when the Father sends him back, excuse me, when the Father sends him back and does all the things he said he's going to do, no one's going to stop him. And he's that right now. Right now. Christ has resurrection power. Christ has authoritative power. Christ also has lordship power. And again, don't forget, we're talking about a prayer. This is a prayer. Do y'all pray like this? I got to learn to pray like this. These are just words of a prayer. Let's keep going. Resurrection power, authoritative power. He also wanted the people of Ephesus, as he's praying for them, to also understand the lordship power that God has through Christ, verses 22 and 23. We'll look at those again. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Lordship power. Look at verse 22. He put all things in, we hate this word, subjection. That is not a word as Americans we like. We don't like being subjugated by anybody, do we? No, but no, we're, Ameri- we're not going to be subjug- sub- subjugated by anybody. This is the United States of America. It says, verse 22, he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over things to the, of all things to the church. You see, as we are in our prayer life and, and we're praying to our God and we're praying to our Savior and we go, God, you, you can raise the dead. I'm trusting you with my life and my soul. God, you are authority over my life and my family and my boss and my country, so so I can trust that you are guiding me the right way. God, I also realize, verse 22 and 23, that I must come under your authority. And there's two things in verses uh, um, verses 22 and 23. It says, all things are subject to him, and he's the head of the church. He's, the church is subject to him as well. You see, there's a picture in those verses in this lordship power. It says, God put all things under his feet. What does it mean to be under someone else's feet? It's not a good place to be, is it? If someone wrestles you to the ground and puts their foot on you, what is that a sign of? Hey, buddy, I love you. I'm thinking about you. I got the best intentions for you. What you doing for Thanksgiving? Is that what that means? No. I think all of humanity understands the picture there. If some person has you in subjection under their feet, that means you lose. They win. If you look at those verses, this power that Christ has, it says everything is in subjection under his feet. And then it says he's the head of the church. So here's here's what you have. You're either going to be under Christ's feet or you're going to be part of his church. Under his feet or part of his body. Which would you rather be? He'll either be judge of you one day. One day he's going to judge everyone. Every fallen angel. Every person that has rejected him. At some point in the future he will say... Time's up. 
now you will bow before me. You rejected me. Now you're under my feet. Or you live for him now. You trust him as your Lord and Savior. You're part of the body. And he says, hey, you're part of my body. I, I, I love you. I, I use you. Uh, you're my hands, you're my feet, you're my legs, you're my arms, you're my eyes. You're, every, you're everything I need in this world. I'm going to use you. Which one do you want to be in? I, I, I prefer to be part of his body. Now, it does say he's the head. And sometimes we don't like that because he's the head and not me, not you. He's the head. But I'd rather be under his headship as part of the body serving him than under his feet one day in judgment. Take some time and read, not today, but take some time and read Hebrews chapter 1. The parallel here is amazing. Go read Hebrews chapter 1 sometime on your own and see where Christ is risen up and enemies are made his footstool. All right. What about our own personal life? This resurrection power, this authoritative power, this lordship power as i mentioned a minute ago you'll either we either will be judged by him under his feet or we serve him as part of the body what choice do you want to make i don't want to repreach all i don't want to repreach all that so i just simply ask you what choice do you want to make bow to him willingly and serve him or bow forcibly at some point in judgment it's better to bow willingly in salvation and be part of his service than to bow in subjection to him. So here, we're going to wrap this up now. We saw in these verses a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. I started off this sermon and I mentioned about prison ministry and how People, including me as a child, we would go in and encourage people in the prison. But here Paul is the prisoner turning around and encouraging other people. That's a pretty amazing faith. And there's a challenge in that, that we might take that same concern, that we put others ahead of our own pain and our own sorrow and our own frustrations, just like Paul did. We talked about that. We saw... Paul, in, in the heart of these verses, talking about the things that he prayed for for the people of Ephesus. And I mentioned those six things. He prayed that they would have knowledge and wisdom. He prayed that they would know what their calling is. He, he prayed that they would have their, their inner person enlightened instead of being darkened. And then, of course, he mentioned power. And then, of course, without repreaching at all, he talked about resurrection power and authoritative power and lordship power. And again, I'm reminded this is a prayer. And I'm convicted that my prayers don't look like this. My prayers are usually, God, I hurt. God, I need something. God, help me. Amen. And I'm looking at this powerful prayer that Paul did, and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of theology here. There's a lot of stuff here, God. So with that in mind, I want to pray with you this morning. Now, we're going to get ready for communion, so our, our, would the gentlemen go ahead and start coming forward? I want to pray with you. I want you to join with me in prayer, kind of like what Paul did. I know it's a, a deep prayer, but I want us to pray for others even more deeply than we do ourselves. And we're not going to go through all these types of things again, but I want us to take a moment and just think, how can I pray for somebody else more so than even praying for me? So we're going to pray. And then we're going to, um, we'll start our communion service after the prayer. So would you bow with me uh, this morning? God, we saw this prayer that Paul did, and it's very theologically rich. Father, it's unlike the prayers we usually pray. God, I'm reminded of myself that I sometimes often pray about me. God, I see Paul praying for others in the midst of his own chains and not just praying lightly. God, this morning, we want to example that and pray for others. Father, we think of those that are in Trinidad right now, serving selflessly. God, help them. 
Help them to finish well in these last couple of days. God, maybe even give them the best days yet in these last couple of days. God, I have my own pains and sorrows, but Lord, I pray for the people of this church. They have pain, and they have sorrows, and they're struggling with wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and they want to understand the power of God in their life, and they want to understand resurrection power. So God, I pray for this church that they would grow and learn. Help them, Father, to know about you. Help Harmony Grove to be growing in knowledge of who you are. Father, we ask these things in the name of your Son, who you raised from the dead. Amen.